is not an answer for many people. I think a lot of people need the uh, the human element of human element of education, which is really important. And and you know, for other other parts of life too, for business and, and other things, human activity, human contact, is something that a lot of us have been missing for some time. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's uh, this is something very substantial for you know he, mm-hmm. personal communication that you are able to interact personally. Okay, um, I assume that uh, uh, saving for others, they shall connect. Uh, sure. Goes so. Uh, shall we? Shall we begin? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So, uh, first of all, on the behalf of the Student uh, Police Society, um, I just would like to welcome everyone and thank you for finding time for joining us. And I would like to introduce you uh, our speaker. This is Mr. Theodore Lisson. And uh, as well as you could have read uh, from, from the description, uh, he has a very successful career uh, in the domain of uh, international uh, corporate disputes resolution. And besides, he is very successful in the role of professor, which I enjoyed personally being a student at Grenoble Year. And uh, so the ground is yours, sir. Could you please talk? Sure. So thank you for having me here. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, happy to be here and speak with you. Um, as Vladislav explained to me, there's not really a formal presentation to give or anything like that. But what I thought I'd do is just kind of introduce myself, kind of explain who I am, what I've done, um, and some things that I'm interested in, and then open it up for just a conversation. If there's any questions or any comments or anything that you guys want to talk about, I'm happy to engage with you. It's my pleasure. So uh, I'll just begin, I guess. So I'm originally from the United States. I live in France right now, but I'm originally from the US, um, from near Chicago. So I'm from the Chicago area, uh, the state of Illinois. Uh, I studied economics originally. I studied at the University of Illinois. I have a bachelor's degree in economics, but I changed paths after that, ultimately going to law school. Um, when I was younger, I, I received a scholarship to study uh, in a different part of the U.S. at the University of Denver in Colorado. So I moved out to Denver. I studied law at the University of Denver. I received a Juris Doctor Diploma, which is a degree which is what we consider to be a professional doctorate, not a research doctorate, as you find, for example, in most European countries, but rather a professional degree. Um, so it's in total seven years of education with the bachelor's and the, and the, do- and the Juris Doctor. And that also means that you're qualified to sit for the bar examination uh, in various U.S. states. And so I took the bar exam first in Colorado and then in New York, which of course was not very enjoyable, but you have to do it. And so I did it and everything worked out. And I practiced law uh, initially in the United States a uh, few years. I first worked for a judge uh, in the court system, uh, working first in Mostly, mostly in civil cases, but also seeing some criminal cases. And I knew that criminal law was not really for me, wasn't really my, um, my preference in terms of practicing law. I knew that family law, doing things like divorces, wasn't really, really for me either. Uh, I was attracted more to the commercial world, uh, and particularly the international commercial world, because I have had some experiences working abroad uh, in Spain, Argentina, Spanish-speaking countries. Being from the U.S., uh, I'm able to speak Spanish. It's a, a widely spoken language in the United States. And uh, so I had some experiences in Spanish-speaking countries and was attracted to those kind of cross-border transactions, cross-border disputes. Now, I was living in Denver, Colorado, which is a, a smaller, it's a, well, it's a small city, but it's not one of the biggest commercial in the United States. And so I got my start working at a law firm, not immediately doing what I, I wanted to do. I said, well, I need to get some experience. I need to get into court. I need to learn how to fight cases um, and learn how the legal system works. And so for a few years, I spent time at a small law firm uh, working. I started, I, I tried working at a larger law firm, but I, I, I preferred the smaller law firm environment because you were able to kind of get your hands on cases a little more quickly. And literally the first, after one week of being at 
this law firm where I really started my career, uh, I was in, in trial working on a case in front of a jury in the United States. And most of these cases when I started out were what we call insurance subrogation cases, uh, mostly in the context of products liability. So when a, when a company um, makes a product, that product has some sort of defect uh, and somebody suffers an injury, very often there's a lawsuit that follows that injury. And we were representing insurance companies who were involved. For example, if you're, if you, let's say you buy a product, that product burns your house down. It explodes and it burns your house down. Uh, you might have insurance, which, which covers your loss. And so you're taken care of, but then the insurance company gets to take the rights that you have from suffering an injury and pursue the rights to recover the money that they ultimately paid out to you as a result of, of your loss. And that's called insurance subrogation. And so that was by no means a passion of mine or something like that, but it was a great place to get good experience working on cases. And frankly, the cases were interesting. A lot of times there was interesting engineering issues and products liability cases and things like that. But I knew that, you know, this isn't something I always want to do. And uh, a few years after that, I had the opportunity to come to France. And uh, I had, all, by that time, I had also started my own law firm. I was working with a uh, another lawyer trying to focus more on moving our law practice, which was a commercial law practice in the direction of international contracts, international disputes. And for family reasons, I had the opportunity to come to France and I was working remotely with a law partner in Denver, Colorado, a law firm called Gleason Wells. Um, and uh, we did that for 10 years. I noticed on the, I, I found the um, description of, of this presentation today. I noticed it said that uh, Gleason Wells that I'm an attorney at Gleason Wells. That has actually recently changed because my former law partner has decided to retire from the practice of law. So <laughs> I'm no, I, I still use Gleason Wells for the moment because we're still cleaning up some, um, some uh, old cases that we have to finish up, et cetera. But I will, I will be working individually for the moment uh, once my law partner's retirement is, uh, is complete, which it pretty much is. So that's no longer my law firm, but we did that for over 10 years together. We worked on a variety of different cases, we brought other people on the law firm. Um, we were able to do quite a few international contracts, international disputes, uh, but at the same time, I was working mostly remotely from France, working with people in the US context. So as you can imagine, given the time difference, there were a lot of late nights, uh, a lot of discussions using mostly Skype, but other tools as well. And uh, it was a, a great experience, a successful experience, and one that, you know, for better or worse, had to come to an end recently. And while I was working remotely uh, in the U.S., I was also offered an opportunity to start as a lecturer at the Grenoble School of Management, which is a French grande école, as they call it. So it's one of the, uh, we've got a strange education system in France where you've got the university system and you've got the école system, right? And I say it's strange, but uh, you know, it's just different than, than what you find in most countries, very unique to France. And the, and the reason I say it's strange is because you have certain elements of education, like engineering, management, business, which are in one, one system. And then you have most other topics that are at the university system. And so I'm actually in this system, in the college system, even though I do do some work at the university. And I was offered the opportunity to start as a lecturer um, here, which, which I did part time for three years. And then later on, they, they asked me to come along, and, and I'm now uh, on the faculty. I'm an uh, associate professor at the Grenoble School of Management. So I've been, for some years now, kind of juggling two different activities, one as a practicing lawyer, one in the academic context, which is very, very nice for me. I like the balance, um, as I'm sure you may be able to imagine. I don't know if we have any law students or legal professionals here, but sometimes the, the, the practice of law can be very stressful, very very time consuming, if rewarding. It is it's it's enjoyable, but it is nice to have uh, the academic activity as well, which is well, you know of course carries with it its own challenges, but it's a very different rhythm and a very different lifestyle. And so I've been here at the Grenoble School of Management for some years now as well on faculty, and I very much enjoy that. I very much enjoy teaching. I very much enjoy the research opportunities that I'm able to engage in as well. Now, during this period, um, you know, I've been introduced as someone who practices international commercial law, and I, I, I agree with that. But in recent years, 
I've had the opportunity to branch out into, I think, a really dynamic area of the law, which is what I really wanted to focus on today, because I think it's an area of not only legal, but also pol political, geopolitical concern. And that is um, investment law, international investment law. And uh, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute, but, but the, the way I got into this field, this was by no means foreseen by me, but um, having worked in, you know, with partners in Denver, Colorado and the United States, having done a fair amount of international commercial legal work, we had somebody come to our firm and said, hey, I've got this strange problem uh, in, an internet, uh, in an Eastern European country. I went and I set up a business there and I basically got chased out of town by people who were uh, uh, not happy that a foreign company had come in and set up a business. Um, I'll get to the details of that in just a minute. Uh, and, and having this client come to us kind of dragged me into this field of law, international investment law, that I had never really considered before. I had not planned this out. It was something that kind of came to me. And since that time, I've, I've worked on others of these disputes now, and I'm also doing significant research in this field of international investment law. Um, and so my practice, my research, and a little bit of my teaching have kind of converged on this point. My teaching still focuses a lot on international commercial law, but my research and, and, and practice focuses have uh, kind of moved or, or morphed into this area of international investment law which I think is, is a really dynamic and really interesting area of law. So that's kind of my career path. And, and like I said, what I wanted to talk to you about was, and I, what I think might be most interesting for us to talk about is international investment law. And I don't know if you know what that is. So I thought I'd start by just basically defining what international investment law is, kind of explaining what I've done in the field. And then from that point, kind of talking about how the field is developing, why it's a dynamic field of law, and you know maybe why you should be interested in this field of law. So as I said, how how did I get into this field of international investment law? Well, it was 2015, I guess, so it's almost six years ago now, that a client came to my old law firm, Gleason Wells, and this client had, like I said, a particular problem in an Eastern European country. Uh, I won't get into too many of the details for confidentiality reasons, but I can give you some of the basic outlines of the dispute. I, this, this particular client had significant experience managing large-scale agricultural projects, farms, and uh, had noticed that there was a lot of available and inexpensive farmland in, in certain Eastern European countries. And he had been successful going into these countries and setting up large farm, farming projects and um, uh, making money, making profit, and having successful business ventures. Well, he ended up going into the Republic of Moldova and in the Republic of Moldova set up a farm, a large scale farm, it was about 3,000 hectares. So uh, large enough farm, not the biggest farm in the world, but by no means a small operation. And ultimately what ended up happening is after cleaning up the fields, the fields had not been used for many years. And after cleaning up the fields, uh, getting them ready to plant seeds, and actually after planting some seeds, um, a local company, a local competitor saw what was going on. And all of a sudden the leases that had been granted by local mayor's offices were all revoked in one day and handed to the local competitor company, right? As I'm sure you can imagine. And after that, he fought, he tried to go to court. He tried talking to the mayors. He tried to get his lands back, him and his employees. And it, it got violent. In fact, they, he was chased out of uh, the land. There's people who showed up with guns and. Uh, they cut the brake lines on his car, and he's, he ultimately felt that his physical safety uh, was compromised, and he had to flee. He left the country. He went back to Colorado in the United States, and he was looking for assistance. He was looking for help. He couldn't get any progress in the local court system. It seemed that the cards, as we'll say, were stacked against him, uh, that the court system wasn't actually impartial, and he didn't really have any local remedy to resolve this situation. In this particular case, he was able to seek international dispute resolution because there's a treaty in place from the early, from the mid '90s um, between the Republic of Moldova and the United States, and it's called the Bilateral Investment Treaty. And what these bilateral investment treaties do is they protect investors. 
So the idea is if a U.S. investor makes an investment in Moldova or wherever the treaty partner is, and there's a dispute between the investor and the local government, the investor has a choice. They can either go to local courts and try to resolve the dispute, or they can take their dispute outside of the local legal system and go to international dispute resolution, resolution typically through the World Bank, typically through the World Bank. Now, these treaties have a long history, right? They go back to the post-World War II era. Uh, the first treaty was in 19, I think 1959 between, I believe it was Germany and Pakistan. And the World Bank got involved by creating an institution, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, which is often referred to as ICSID. And ICSID is supposed to be a neutral forum hosted by the World Bank where investors and states can resolve these disputes. Now, typically, it goes both, in theory at least, it goes both ways. So a U.S. investor has rights against the Moldovan government if something goes wrong, like an expropriation or something like that. And vice versa, a Moldovan investor would have rights against the U.S. government. But if you think about that, these treaties are really designed in their, uh, at their core to prevent, protect investors. And investors are much, much, much more likely to come from the U.S. than they are from the Republic of Moldova, right? So there is an element of uh, what we call asymmetry in these relationships. They're designed to protect uh, investors who obviously mostly come from traditionally capital exporting nations. So there's a lot of controversy about this field of law, which I'll get into momentarily. At any rate, we took this case. Um, we're, we're a small law firm. Usually these, these types of cases are handled by really, really big law firms. We have tons of resources, um, but we were a small operation at the time. We were four lawyers. We brought in a couple extra lawyers for help, especially with linguistic issues because of a lot of the documents in that case with the Republic of Moldova were in Romanian or Russian, right? We also had some documents in Polish. We had documents in English. So linguistically, it was a big mess. So we needed to bring in people who could help out with that. We took the case to, all the way to hearing. Um, the result, uh, you know, without getting into details, was mitigated. We, we won on a treaty breach. So we, did, we were able to succeed in the sense that uh, we found that the investment was uh, expropriated without compensation. Um, of course, we asked for a very large award of damages. The other side said, no, there should be no damages. And the result was somewhere in between, as is very often the case in, in legal proceedings. Very often in real life, when you have a, a lawsuit, whether it's in a commercial context, an investment context, the plaintiff or the claimant asks for everything in the moon, right? They want everything. And uh, of course, the defendant or the respondent says, no, they should get nothing. And that's the role of a judge or an arbitrator is to figure out what is the appropriate amount of damages. Very rarely is it actually everything that the plaintiff or claimant asked for. Um, sometimes it could be, but you need, of course, uh, <clears throat> good evidence for that. And I won't get into all the problems on, on, the, on the damages claim in that case. But in the end, it was, it was pretty successful. At small law firms, uh, it's hard to win those types of cases. And we won on the treaty breach claim. And uh, we're the first law firm from the state of Colorado in the United States to actually take that type of case and prevail. Since then, I've been working on these types of cases uh, a bit more regularly. Uh, sometimes it's been providing just advice on uh, an investment which has um, perhaps suffered or, or run into problems with the local host state government. Uh, I've got another one of these cases in an ICSID proceeding. It was supposed to go to hearing just in February, but it got moved. It'll be going to hearing in Paris in June, um, hopefully in person, but we'll see. Maybe we'll have to do the hearing online, which is a little more complex, but that's what we're, we've been doing for the last year when we have hearings. And uh, I've been also completing a fair amount of research in this field of international investment law because there's a lot of questions which surround this field of law. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, as I said, a lot of these treaties, bilateral investment treaties, uh, and sometimes multilateral, what we call them, international investment agreements, were negotiated, I think we could say, at the height of the neoliberal era of, of economic thinking. Uh, a lot of this was in the 80s, especially in the uh, 90s, mid-90s. Perhaps uh, you saw a lot of these treaties come into place at the collapse of the Soviet Union, for example, when you had new republics who were looking to attract investment into their, their, their states, 
but it was really all over the world. It's not a phenomenon limited to one particular region of the world. Um, now, this system didn't really cause too much trouble at the beginning. There really weren't that many cases filed by investors. Again, these treaties, they date all the way back to you know, the uh, mid 20th century, but we really started seeing more and more of these treaties in the 80s um, and early 90s. But things started, people started to question the system a little bit more uh, beginning in the late 90s and early 2000s because you started to see an explosion of cases. And a lot of times these cases involve, there's two types which are controversial. There's one, well, it's more than two types. There's two major types, which I think we could say are controversial. Uh, one is where you have large companies from Western capital exporting states who run into trouble, run into some sort of dispute with, with governments in perhaps less economically developed states uh, due to maybe regulatory changes, okay? So let's say, let me just give a complete hypothetical here. This is not based on a real case, but it's just to kind of demonstrate where the conflict could be. Let's say that you have a mining company. A mining company goes into a, a less developed economic state and they start an investment, they build a mine. The less developed state changes their environmental regulations which is gonna mean that the mining company is gonna make a less of a profit as a result. The mining company might attempt to sue the, the state outside of its own judicial system using a bilateral investment treaty or an international investment agreement if, uh, if one is in place. And that causes a lot of controversy. Uh, environmental advocates, for example, would say, hey, wait, shouldn't we be able to regulate the environment and do what's you know, in, in the public interest instead of putting investor rights above uh, the public interest and so that's one type of case that's caused a lot of consternation over the years is a regulatory dispute let me give you two real examples of that um, the first is about cigarettes some of you may be our smokers and if you buy a pack of cigarettes in some countries well a long time ago or not even that long ago you buy a pack of cigarettes any of the world if you buy a pack of marlboros that pack of marlboro looks relatively similar no matter where you buy it in the world, but that's changed in recent years. Now, I don't know what cigarette packs look like in Russia, but if you come to here to France and you buy a pack of Marlboro, you can't really tell that it's a pack of Marlboro, right? Or camels or whatever, whatever type of cigarette that you like because they've removed the trademarks, the logos from packaging. There's one standardized form of packaging, which is a black box with maybe a warning on it, you know, smoking kills, et cetera and maybe a picture, a graphic of uh, you know, what smoking can do to you. And this type of tobacco packaging, which is called plain packaging, and I've written an article on this, was started first in Australia. It was the Australian government, which was the first state to successfully implement this type of uh, plain packaging cig or tobacco product regulation. Philip Morris, the company, you know, the cigarette, the tobacco producer, sued the Australian government. They sued the Australian government saying that by putting this packaging regulation in place, you've essentially taken our property from us. You've taken our intellectual property from us. We've got valuable trademarks that we can no longer use anymore. And uh, they sued the Australian government for four billion with a B. Australian dollars, so it's something like 3 billion euros, right? So it's a very significant amount of money. And you can imagine the public outcry which occurred when that happened. Uh, and, and then Uruguay in South America had a similar regulation and Philip Morris sued Uruguay shortly thereafter. So there were two of these cases and there was huge public reaction, huge public outcry. And from a public health advocate's perspective, very fortunately, Philip Morris lost both of those cases, but you can maybe see why it's so controversial. It's, it's, it's a collision between these treaties which protect, protect investor rights and the right to regulate in the public interest. In this case, the right to regulate in the interest of public health. One other example, and then I'll move on, is related to um, Germany. You probably all remember about 10 years ago, there was the Fukushima disaster in Japan, where you had a nuclear reactor which had suffered a meltdown as a result of the tsunami. And that caused a lot of fear, legitimately, 
around the world concerning the use of nuclear energy. And in Germany, the, the regulations concerning, as a result of public pressure, the regulations concerning nuclear energy changed. And they put a moratorium on the, on the construction of uh, nuclear power plants. I don't know all the details of the moratorium, but they could no longer build certain types of power plants uh, as a result of a regulation change, a regulatory change. Well, the problem was there were power plants which were in the process of being built at that time. And one company in particular called Vattenfall, which is a Swedish firm, had been building nuclear power plants in Germany. And they were told to stop. You can no longer build these nuclear power plants in Germany. We've got a new law, sorry. Uh, we're not allowing you to build these nuclear facilities anymore. Okay, problem is a significant investment had been um, engaged in by these firms, right? They put billions of euros into the project, uh, at least hundreds of millions. And so there's a treaty in place called the Energy Charter Treaty, which is a multilateral treaty for energy, which uh, provides for the same type of investor state dispute resolution, as it's called. So this Swedish firm sued Germany, again, using the World Bank uh, facilities, ICSID, and uh, they sued them for 4.7 billion, with a B, euros, so really large claim. Um, and this case has been going on for years and it actually just settled last week. So the German government agreed to pay the Vattenfall Swedish energy firm 1.4 billion euros just last week. And, uh, and a couple other energy firms were part of the settlement as well. So you can see it's another area where you've got public interest, public interest, which is in conflict with investor protection. And so this has become a very controversial area of international law. But there's another type of case which I think has led to even more concern from West, traditionally Western capital exporting countries who put the system in place in the first place. And it's somewhat hypocritical, I must be honest. And it's the fact that originally these types of treaties, bilateral investment treaties, were between a traditionally capital exporting state and an economically developing state. So the likelihood was that if there was ever a claim, it would be from an investor from the traditionally capital exporting state against the state which is in the course of economic development. That all changed in the 90s with our agreements like the North American Free Trade Agreement and this agreement, the Energy Charter Treaty, which that last example about the uh, nuclear energy uh, situation in Germany was about. What happened with, for example, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, which is no longer in place as of last year, was that these claims started to be brought by, for example, U.S. firms against Canadian fir against the Canadian government, or Canadian firms against the U.S. government, um, or European ca traditionally capital exporting uh, countries found themselves being sued by investors from other European states, for example, under the Energy Charter Treaty. So there's a large amount of hypocrisy that has led to the <laughs> ongoing reform of this area of law. Everything was fine. The system of law seemed to work really well when uh, the traditional capital exporting countries weren't really sitting in the respondent's chair. But from the late, very late 90s, early 2000s, once these states started to kind of sit on the other side of these disputes and sued for large amounts of money, whether it's Australia or Germany or the US or Canada, um, they kind of started to change their approach to this field of law. And uh, what happened was in 2017, at the United Nations, at the Commission on International Trade Law, there was a big discussion about whether there should be multilateral reform of this area of law. Because right now what you have is you've got over 2,500 of these agreements, bilateral investment treaties and international investment agreements, which exist in the world. So that means there's not really a lot of harmony in how this law works. There's not always a lot of clarity in how this law works. There's just a fragmentation. You've got, again, over 2,500 different agreements and each agreement might be a little bit different from each other agreement. And so the question arises, should we even have a system? If we should have the system, how should it function? And since 2017, at the United Nations, at the Commission on International Trade Law, 
there have been ongoing state level discussions about actually reforming this area of law. And my area of research over the last couple of years has been digging into to the reforms and more particularly, how can we uh, come up with a system of law, international law, which has a higher level of coherency between protecting investors' rights, which has a utility, which is important in certain circumstances, but with other societal concerns like regulating public health, or regulating the environment or meeting climate change issues and things like that. And it's not an easy question to answer, but those are the, the, that's kind of where I'm focusing my attention on my research. Um, of course, when I have a case as a lawyer, I defend my client's interests. That's a different, that's a different hat that you're wearing when you're a lawyer. So I kind of look at this area of law very differently depending on which hat I'm wearing. If I'm representing a client, I will analyze whatever laws are in place. It's not about what the law should be when you're representing a client, it's about what the law is. And you're trying to uh, interpret the law and make arguments based on the law in, that, in a way that best reflects your client's interests and needs. When I have the other hat on, when I have my research hat on, my academic hat on, I'm looking not at you know, how does the law affect this practical situation, but I'm thinking about what's wrong with the law, how should the law be reformed or how should it be changed to perhaps create a more just or, or better international community. Um, so that's where I've been, you know, kind of very interested in, 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 in devoting a lot of my attention and uh, efforts towards in recent years. And I know I've kind of thrown a lot of information at you over the last 30 minutes or so. Um, but I think I'll stop there, and I hope it's been interesting, and I hope that uh, you have some questions. If you have questions, I'm very happy to open the floor up to you and answer any questions that you might have. And I've really only scratched the surface. I didn't want to try to go into too much detail here, but I'm happy to go into more detail in response to whatever questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Glisson. Yeah. Uh, this is a wonderful introduction, uh, indeed, and I have to admit uh, that... Uh, uh, it actually feels like you are just scratching, scratching the surface with all these uh, introductory, introductory words. You know, uh, may I please start the discussion with asking you something? Um, and uh, all the participants, they are uh, warmly invited to 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 gather us here. And uh, may I please ask you? I I found a very interesting point about. Uh, moving from us to france uh, which you mm -hmm. found uh, appropriate for you besides uh, about moving your um, education and moving to a very different career uh -huh. uh, which, uh, which uh, you did actually could you please explain if this is not very personal of course uh, could you please explain a bit uh, about your motivation behind doing that well, it's very simple. Uh, my motivation was very much related to personal circumstances because my wife is French. And so <laughs> I guess that was the, the catalyst for me moving to France. Uh, I had lived in Europe previously and that's where I met my wife. She lived with me for many years in the United States and she had an opportunity, professional opportunity, uh, personal opportunity as well in, in France. And so we said, yeah, well, let's do it. It was supposed to be temporary. It was supposed to be temporary. It was supposed to be for like a year or so. Uh, ultimately, it's been seemingly permanent because over, uh, over 10 years later, I'm still here. But that was, the, that was the short answer. And I was fortunate to be in a position at that time where I said, okay, if it's just a year or two years, that's fine. I, I, I've worked for some years. I have some you know, uh, means I can, I can survive. But, um, and I was also working remotely with a law firm in the U.S., but it was never intended to be <laughs> what it was. And I guess that's, that's one of the, and it's not easy either, like moving from, especially in law, the problem with law is it's not really easy to just pick up and work in another country because every country has its own laws, right? So it wasn't simple for me to just simply start working in France. And that's why I continued working remotely with people in the US. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think that there's not one way to have a career. There, there's not one, predefined way to to make your living and, and, and what you want to do professionally in life. And there was a lot of just, I think, flexibility. If I wasn't flexible, it wouldn't have worked out, right? If I would have said, no, I need to do X. Well, X wasn't always possible. And so you have to find other ways 
to uh, just continue moving forward. And, uh, you know, I knew I wanted to practice law in an interna international context. I thought it would be more of an international commercial law context. It's turned out to be this other area of law, which is, well, I did still is some international commercial stuff, but it's mostly now in this area of in international investment law. And of course, that wasn't by design. That was kind of by happenstance or by luck, I suppose. I'm, I'm fortunate that I enjoy it. But um, we can we can set out a plan or we can set out a chart on what we think we want to do. And most of us will not have, you know, you look back 10 years later and say, well, I thought I was going to do this, but it ended up being something else. And that's very much what happened to me. And it wasn't always easy. There's no doubt about it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, uh, dear participants, do you have some questions to our speaker? Okay, so not for now. And may I please just go on? And uh, uh, you, I apologize for, for saying that once again. Uh, you are welcome to tap right hand mark on your on your panel, and afterwards I shall give you a word. That that that's for sure. Okay. And uh, Mr. Gleason, could you please? Uh, Tell a bit more about because since you men uh, since you mentioned that originally you had an education within the domain of economics, um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what have you found particularly interesting about starting career within the domain of law? Well, okay, so the legal education system in the United States is a bit different than what you find in most European countries in the sense that. Um, you don't actually start studying law at the um, undergraduate level, as we call it. So in your you know, licence or bachelor's or whatever you call it in your country, you don't typically study law in the U.S. And I was uh, I was doing economics. I probably got to my limit on mathematical economics in my undergraduate degree. I realized that, right? When you get an economics degree, there's a fair amount of math that's involved. And um, I knew I wanted to do graduate education. And uh, I said, I like uh, the idea of law. I think there's a good um, possibility to help people and get involved in things that I'm interested in. I knew, like I said, my in terms of graduate studies, my interest in, in, in perhaps my quantitative skills were not up to what was required to you know, pursue perhaps mathematical, or excuse me, a higher level economics degree. And Legal education in the United States is the postgraduate education. The typical way that you go through the course of study in the U.S. is you receive what we call a Juris Doc, like I said earlier. Um, the uh, doctor program takes people from the, I don't remember what it stands for, but you have to take an exam because uh, I took it so many years ago, I can't remember what it stands for. But it's a kind of an exam which tests you on your logic and reasoning. And based on your score on that exam, you, you qualify for certain different universities. That's kind of how it works. Uh, and um, I did it. I did well. I had a scholarship opportunity to go, like I said, go to U University of Denver. Of course, that's a big factor in the United States where education is expensive. Right. I'm, uh, for example, the universities in France are generally free. I mean, there are some small fees, um, but compared to the United States, where even at a public university, you're going to be paying, you know, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars per year just for your uh, tuition fees, et cetera. Uh, you have to take the economics of education into consideration. And so having received a scholarship offer to go to this particular university in in Denver, I said, yeah, why not? Let's do it. And I was young. You know, when you're young, you can make those kinds of decisions. And uh, I think it was the right decision, fortunately. But that's kind of how I got there. Um, I would say when I, when I had my economics degree, uh, when I was 22 years old, uh, I, don't, I can't say with any, uh, I mean, honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly at that point in time. And, and I don't think that's strange. Um, so when you're, you know, at that age, it's... Uh, not always clear, but I did know that I wanted to continue my education, and so that's how I ended up going to law school. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And we have just another participant uh, has an intention to say something. Just uh, shall we introduce him? Sure. Okay. Hello. 
Uh, good afternoon, Vlad. Good afternoon, Professor Gleason. Uh, thank you Hello. for uh, for the interesting uh, discussion. Yeah, my name is Slava. I'm studying world politics, and um, uh, my question uh, concerns a, a little not your profile. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, I see the topic interesting to many people. Um, the question concerns international law in the areas of security and uh, human rights. Okay. Uh, by, by, by the way, uh, the world lockdown has been going uh, on almost uh, exactly uh, one year, and many states do not allow citizens uh, to, to visit our parts of the uh, world uh, because of uh, so-called unimportant reasons, yeah, like uh, the tourism, uh, I don't know, we visit uh, somebody but not your uh, family and so on and so on. However, those who travel abroad for study or medicine or diplomacy uh, have uh, this opportunity to, to travel and, of course, to visit some, I don't know, treasures or uh, something. And uh, so what do you think? How could this um, injustice uh, be resolved? And, uh, of course, uh, for me, it's interesting generally your position about the, the regulation in the pandemic uh, time. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so that's a complicated question because what you've had over the last year is public health concerns, right? And I think what states have done up to this point, generally speaking, is put public health concerns above competing rights. They're saying, you know, um, and, and I'm by no means an expert in, in this particular area of international law, but I think we've got to look at it from that perspective. I think what the states have have done is they've made a conscious decision to, well, there's a whole lot of unknown, especially if we go back one year ago, right? Let's go back one year in time. We know a lot more now today in, 20, in March of 2021 than we did in March of 2020 concerning you know, how does the virus function? And I am not an epidemiologist, I don't pretend to be, but just generally speaking as societies, we know more about how it functions. Uh, when all these travel restrictions were initially put in place, I think they were using the, the in the, I think the, the principle that they were following is, you know, the, uh, sort of a precautionary pr principle saying we don't know exactly how bad this is going to get. We don't know how many people are potentially going to be affected. And those were the uh, considerations. I think, I mean, is your question more about is it fair or is it just or, you know, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Maybe that's not what you're asking. Maybe it is unfair. I mean, there is quite a few restrictions still in place. For example, here in France, we have I have similar restrictions to what you're dealing with there. I have no idea, actually. But here in France, you can't travel unless you have an imperative reason. You can't leave. For example, I can't go visit my family in the U.S. unless I have an imperative reason, like somebody in my family died or something. Is that fair? Perhaps not, but I guess public health concerns have outweighed uh, conceptions of fairness in this context. I'm sure. not sure. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer. I don't know what else I can say about that. Yeah, sure. I agree. Yeah. I, 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 might, I totally agree with you. I just mm -hmm. uh, saw a, a, a lot of the news and the opinions uh, from mass media people. Uh, for example, in Russia, we think that it's a, a kind of a stupid that somebody uh, in the Europe make, uh, I don't know how it's called in English, sorry, but uh, it's like a, a wall time. And uh, we see that in some... Um, a little bit poorer countries, as I don't know, as Germany or France, there is no uh, some uh, some uh, uh, closing things like uh, I don't know uh, restrictions uh, to work in uh, shops or uh, yeah some uh, public places yeah and we see mm -hmm. that for example our medical system he, he, he's okay to to, to survive <laughs> in this time yeah so it's mm. it, 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 it just not a kind of interest and and you know when if we want to look at this kind of more what I'm in, uh, able to talk about if we want to look at this from an international law perspective we have to always remember that states are sovereign right that states can uh with with certain limitations on this but state, states can implement whatever internal regulations that they think are, are best for their local circumstances you know one area that this actually fits into what i was talking about is um, there's been a lot of restrictions on all kinds of things over the Year, which were unforeseeable just you know 18 months ago and there's a big concern that there that that there's going to be a rise in investment law cases so what happens to all these businesses who have made investments in other countries and then their investments were stopped by covid restrictions are those are those firms are those private 
investment companies? Are they going to be able to sue states for putting in public health regulations? There's a lot of concern about that. That's that kind of regulatory dispute. So far, we haven't seen those disputes manifest as of yet because uh, it usually takes some time for between when a regulation goes into place and when a lawsuit might arise. You know, it might be two or three years after the fact. That's something maybe interesting to keep your eye on. I think those lawsuits will not be by the international community. They won't be too kindly received. I think a lot of people will say, hey, this is nonsense. Don't bring these types of lawsuits. But um, there may be some controversial lawsuits which arise in the investment context out of these types of COVID restrictions. Whether that's a travel restriction, whether that's just shutting down certain types of non-essential businesses, we'll have to wait and see. But it could be something interesting to follow over the next couple of years. This is uh, certainly pretty interesting, I have to admit. Uh, you know, I just um, uh, if if uh, no one uh, no one no one has nothing to say on the matter, I just want to uh, to suggest you to change the direction of our discussion in a different in a different path. Uh, could you please uh, tell? Because uh, this is really interesting, uh, maybe to me personally, as mm -hmm. I'm slightly younger than you are which is pretty obvious. Um, could you please tell, uh, uh, have you actually found something you were actually interested? Because you told them you were younger, you actually didn't know exactly where to go. And you were, I, I just had have, have such sense that you were, um, you were making choice on, on the way it goes. And uh, I'm just wondering, can you say that you have have actually found something you are interested in? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think it was okay. So, if I understand correctly, um, I, maybe maybe I misspoke or maybe I was misinterpreted earlier. When I finished my economics degree, I knew I was not going to be an economist per se. All right, let's let's put it that way. And I knew I wanted to continue my education. I knew I was interested in law, so I knew that much. The problem with law is that it's this vast field, right? Of course. So, so I think what I mean when I say that I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do was within the field of law. Oh, okay. I, I didn't, I didn't know exactly which path I would take. And the great thing about continuing your education and going to law school and and, and even being an early early career lawyer is that within the field of law you can try various different things. Right. So, um, you know, it was relatively early on when I was studying law in law school that I uh, had a, uh, some great classes on international law topics. Um, I had perhaps an interest in economic issues, business issues as a result of my previous studies in in economics. So um, I think that it was quite natural for me to fall into my career path. And it is definitely something that I'm interested in. And I'm very happy that I found my point was, you know, if. if um, you know, could I, when I was in law school, could I have projected where I would be in 10 years? No, no, it was not possible, right? So my point was simply, you might have a career path charted out for you, or maybe you don't, which is fine, if I didn't, but maybe you have some ideas charted out in front of you. The likelihood that it's going to go exactly like that is very slim if, you know, there's zero chances for most people that it's going to end up the way you think it's going to end up. And so I think that a, a really important, you know, just, just career perspective, a really important trait or characteristic that we can all have is flexibility and, and you know, seeing opportunities and maybe taking those opportunities, even if it wasn't exactly what you, you thought you would be doing, because you never know what's going to happen. That being said, I can't speak for everybody. Every, it's very personal as well. That, that, that's for sure, of course. Yeah. Uh, and uh, may I just ask you one more question on the matter? Uh, why have you created your own company? Because you mentioned sure. uh, uh, for for some for some graduates, and I'm talking not only about my course, but about many many of graduates, uh, especially nowadays, uh, they are experiencing that severe difficulties with finding something to start their career. So uh, some of them consider starting their own companies. And I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, was it the case your time? Well, for me, it was about having flexibility. Um, one of the things that always attracted me to the practice of law was 
the ability for lawyers to work for themselves. It's a kind of profession where that's made relatively, uh, relatively simple and it's quite common that lawyers either work by themselves or maybe with a small other group of lawyers. Some lawyers work for really big law firms with a thousand lawyers, right? But a very large amount also work kind of individually or, or like I said, in small groups. And um, that's just the nature of the profession. So I think that's one of the reasons I did it. Um, when you work for other lawyers, so when you, you gotta start working for other lawyers, it's the best way to learn. But after some time, you realize that you're just making those other lawyers money for things that you could be doing on your own, right? You've gotta get your own clients, that's the hard part. But uh, once you've learned how to practice law, it's actually something that um, <clears throat> you can be much more efficient, take the cases you want, take the clients you want, uh, do the things you want when you're working for yourself. And you can't necessarily do that when you're working in, a, uh, in somebody else's law firm structure. So that's kind of what attracted me to, to starting my own business, my own law firm, was the independence and the flexibility that that afforded me. So that was really attractive to me. It's hard for me to kind of give more generalist I guess advice or, or, or whatever out of that because the uh, because of the unique nature of the particular profession that I'm in, right? I think it's a lot harder if you're going to start. You know, I don't know. I've had a lot of clients over in the past who are you know working on. Um, I had some clients who were working on smartphone applications or something like that. It's hard to start that kind of business where you're providing some side of, sort of product or service on your own. I think it's a, a little bit more complicated because maybe you've got higher capital requirements for you to start your activity in the first place. Whereas in my profession, just to start my business, what do I need? I need my brain, right? And I need maybe some, some access to some research databases uh, and a computer. And that's basically it. And if I can sell myself and my knowledge and provide good services to my client, there's very little overhead for that type of activity. And so I guess that's why it was possible and relatively simple. Uh, I wouldn't say simple, simplify not the right word, but administratively simple, let's say, uh, to start my own business with another uh, former partner now, um, over 10 years ago. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Our dear guests, do you have something to ask from our, our speaker? Okay, not yet. Fine. Uh, you know, and uh, um, I just would like to uh, go on with that. Uh, since you, since you, uh, since you uh, told about starting the law f uh, law firm, what would you what would you advise to ones are interested in starting their own law practices? Well, um, you've got to, as we say, where I'm from, you've got to grind. You've got to try to really get out there and make yourself known among uh, potential clients, but also I think other lawyers, a lot of, and now, okay, beware that what I'm gonna say is, is relevant from my particular legal culture, which is based in the US mostly, but I've seen this also in France. A lot of times the most important relationships you can have in law are with other lawyers because we hand cases off to each other. We, hand, we give each other business in the sense that I might have somebody come to me and they've got a legal question that maybe I don't have experience answering or maybe I'm just not interested in. Like if somebody came to me and said, hey, I wanna get, I wanna get a divorce. I would say, well, I'm not the right lawyer for you, but I know, I know this lawyer over here who's uh, a good divorce lawyer. And this is how it works. This is how a lot of times uh, we end up building our businesses. It's not only through getting to know clients directly, maybe through professional associations or groups like this or whatever the case may be, but also through getting to know our colleagues who are also practicing law. They're not our enemies, right? They're our friends. And the more that we uh, are able to build those types of relationships, the more well-known you are in your professional community and the more likely it is, it's going to be you know, financially beneficial for you in the long run as well. So I guess that would be a big tip that I'd give. And I'd also say, you just gotta be prepared, especially maybe the first two years, especially to, um, have some times where it's not easy, where there's there's going to be moments where you're looking for work, and and ultimately, uh, if you keep working at it, you keep making those relationships, it, it, things do fall into place. But it's not always easy when you're working on your own. You don't always have someone giving you uh, the next case. You don't know necessarily how much money you're going to make in the next month or year or whatever the case is. So you have to have a certain level of risk tolerance as well. 
Okay, so basically uh, the one who is going to start uh, one's own practice has to be really a risk taker. Yeah. Otherwise, this is not very relevant to that person. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. Huh? Uh, okay. Uh, so, and uh, I'm just wondering, uh, could you please um, share with us if this is uh, possible and appropriate? Uh, have you ever had the cases that you were approached by fresh graduates, just to say, uh, who had an intention to have some experience, some initial experience, and how how have you treated that person? Uh, were you helping or were you advising to try something something else or to try to approach another person within that demand? So do you mean in the, in the legal field or just generally? Um, uh, since we are talking about the legal field right now, I just would like to start within the legal field, but okay. if you can share some experience about the general things, uh, we would highly appreciate that. Well, all right, so in the past, um, especially, you know, when, before we just recently, uh, before my law partner just recently retired from the practice of law, we would often take on, uh, young graduates in, you know, kind of, I would say on a contract basis or, or internship basis, depending on the circumstances, but to help maybe we're a small law firm. So we'd, we'd have them help us maybe on a part-time basis or a uh, contract basis, you know, working on particular projects. Um, and I thought that was really useful because I think that the, uh, like I said, a lot of times when you're a young graduate, you don't necessarily know where you're going to go with your, with your practice, with your career. And, um, that gives you an opportunity to try different things. I didn't mention this when I was kind of introducing myself, but when I very, very initially finished law school, I did that with about three different law firms. And sometimes at the same time, I was working on a project for one law firm one day, another law firm the next day. And that was a way to build experience. And whether we're able to help young graduates like that or not just kind of depends on the workflow at the particular time that they come to us because we can't necessarily, um, or like I said, not being a larger law firm, we weren't able to uh, necessarily say we always have big projects going on. Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. But when we did, we would identify graduates uh, who were, you know, maybe had good interests or the interests in line with what we were thinking, uh, people we liked, of course, and we'd bring them on to help uh, as, as much as possible. And one of those people actually ultimately joined our firm as a partner later on. So he came on, he started working on just as an intern and then working on some projects, we were paying him some money. And then ultimately he all, uh, became a shareholder in our firm and, and we worked very closely with him for about six years. So those relationships can blossom. Most of the time it doesn't really go that far, but it can. Um, I've also worked with um, graduates from a non-law context, very often because I do have experience helping small businesses I've had uh, former students of mine, especially since I teach most often at a business school, I've had those more entrepreneurial students of mine come to me and say, hey, look, can you help me with this contract or can you help me set up my business or whatever the case may be? And I'm usually very, very happy to help. However, I always tell those students, um, the one thing I cannot do, the one thing I cannot do is just give you detailed free advice. And the reason for that is not because I'm trying to be greedy or something like that. The reason for that is because when a lawyer gives advice, their professional responsibility is implicated. Meaning that if the lawyer gives advice that is for you know one reason or another, unfortunately incorrect, the lawyer can be held responsible for whatever damage they cause their client. And so if I'm going to engage my professional responsibility and my ethical obligations towards someone, I want to make sure that we actually have a formalized attorney-client relationship. So usually when students come to me with kind of legal questions about setting up their own business or a contract they're going to sign or something like that, I give them two options. I say, look, I can give you very generalized assistance and, and point you in the right direction. And I'm happy to do that. Just maybe let's have coffee. Let's just talk about your situation. Or on the other hand, if you want something more detailed, we're going to have to formalize it. And, and I don't like doing that, but I think it's just by nature of the profession, 
Um, you kind of have to do that because unfortunately, now this hasn't, knock on wood as we say, that this hasn't happened to me, but unfortunately lawyers do somewhat regularly get sued by their clients because what, what, what happens when something doesn't go as a client wishes? Well, they try to blame somebody. Maybe they try to blame their lawyer. Maybe it was the lawyer's fault. Maybe it wasn't, but uh, they might still blame the lawyer, um, even if the lawyer did everything they were supposed to do just because they want to blame somebody. That's why lawyers generally carry insurance, right? But I don't want to engage that type of responsibility unless, like I said, there's a criminal action in place. So I know I've talked about a lot of things there, but uh, I hope that helps answer your concern, your question. Yeah, that, that, that's for sure. And uh, do we have some other questions? This is okay. You don't need to be shy. We are not biting. And that, that, that's okay. That's okay if there's no questions. Uh, I'm just okay. happy. Uh, at least not yet. And, uh, you know, um, having, having, having known the uh, corporate culture in France and in Europe in general, I can't say if it feels very common in there. And I'm just wondering, is such an attitude you just, um, you just showed uh, particular to the US or is it particular to you are as a person? I think it's particular to me, just my, my personal approach. Although um, I would say that it's particular to lawyers as well. The kind of idea that we need to formalize something is, is very much, I think, a, a legalistic approach to things. But in general, you know, I'm, I'm happy to help students who show an interest in um, themselves and in, in their in their career paths and things like that. I mean, you'd be, uh, well, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but uh, I see a lot of students every year. I see a lot of students every year. And for better or worse, most of them just come and go and, and never, you know, say another word. And that's fine. I'm sure I was the same way with a lot of my professors. But I really, uh, when, it, when a student shows interest and when a student says, hey, I'm interested in this topic or they show interest in themselves and their career, uh, I'm happy to, to help those types of people. I mean, um, I think, and I don't know if this is probably quite cultural, but I think that when we show a certain amount of enthusiasm or interest in others, that's usually reciprocated. Not always, we can't predict that, but I think that's somewhat important. And so I'm sure most of you being younger and being maybe in a, the, the posture of a student, you're going to find connection with some of your teachers, but definitely not all. But when you do uh, find those, those teachers that you like or those professors that you like and you show them interest, and um, hopefully they, like I said, it probably depends on the personal circumstances of the teacher and their time availability, et cetera. But if, if there is some interests that are shared, very often there will be reciprocation. Because most of us who, who do get involved in, in higher level education, we like what we do, right? We like our topics and we like talking about it. You can't get us to stop talking about it if you get us started, right? So like the, the investment law thing, I just talked about the really basic stuff. I could keep going and going and going. You guys probably would be asleep, but I would be very, very engaged. I, I enjoy it. So when I do see people who are interested in talking about that, I really enjoy it talking to them about that professors like to hear themselves talk right <laughs> that's for sure being a teacher myself i have to admit that yeah pretty often. i really enjoy listening to myself and i i really do understand that this is not that right uh, no it's not necessarily it's not necessarily a positive trait but it's just maybe a shared trait of people in that particular uh, context uh, probably probably um, and uh, could you please uh, tell a bit more about your um, about your academic career since you started one? Uh, you you were telling very warmly about mm -hmm. your um, about your impressions from it, and I'm just wondering: um, Are you satisfied with your academic career that you are teaching, and how does it? I'm satisfied with how it's going. I wouldn't say, I think I'm just getting started. And the reason I say that is because I spent a very long time, you know, pra more practicing law than, than teaching and researching law. So I've come into it maybe a little bit later than a traditional academic. In fact, in the U.S., in North America, um, 
most law professors, they don't have a research doctorate. They don't have a PhD. They would have a JD, like what I have, and that's sufficient. I've noticed that here in France um, and Europe more generally, the preference is that law professors have a, a PhD. So I'm actually writing a PhD thesis right now, in addition to everything else I'm doing. I'm making significant progress on it, but it's not quite finished. And so my hope is to um, uh, <clears throat> finish that within the next, I would say, 18 months, you know, be finished. It takes a long time to do that, right? But that's my goal. Um, and in the meantime, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to publish other papers and, and I'm really, I really decided to, uh, to go a little bit further into the academic side of my career, not just teaching, but also the research side of my career. And it came late. Like I said, a career is not predefined. Um, and one of the things that actually caused me to do that was, as I had mentioned earlier today, my, my former law partner has recently retired. And I said, well, you know, this seems like it's a good time to, to do that, to, to kind of um, cement my role as a, as a researcher. And um, I've been enjoying the process. It's, it's a lot of late nights and a lot of reading, as I'm sure you can imagine, but uh, it's, it's quite enjoyable. So um, I would say I'm just getting started, like I said, as, a, as an academic, as a researcher. I've had the opportunity to publish a few papers uh, and things of that nature, which is great. And I look forward to doing much, much more of that in the future. I, I, I have to admit that this is brilliant. As uh, And by the way, I have seen some of your publications, especially on LinkedIn, where you have published it. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, really, I'm really happy. And I can tell you that I sincerely appreciate that you expressing so, so, so much of your uh, of your interest towards what what do you do because so this is very rarely to see such an attitude uh, mm -hmm. expressed by by someone nowadays as people mostly hate their jobs uh, but they do just because they have to do and this is something well it's not easy to find something that you enjoy and, and be able to i guess monetize it but um, you know, and I don't know, what's the background of, of most of the people who are listening here? Are you mostly political science students or is it a quite mi a, a mix of the profiles or background? Uh, this is really a mix of a background, but mostly we have an audience uh, from political science uh, mm -hmm. or law, since uh, you are a law, a law professional, then yeah. we invited uh, the relevant audience uh, sure. in order to listen to you as uh, they found this pretty useful and they were indeed very uh, very excited about the prospect to to see you maybe just some maybe shy to talk out that's okay um, one thing i would say about that is the the, the profession of law and the problem with that if, if some of you are law students who are listening is what i say in terms of practicing law starting a law practice etc very very particular to my circumstances as a lawyer licensed in the u.s and I think that I can't really speak to what it's like to be, I think most of you are in Russia, right? I can't speak to what it's like to be a legal professional in the Russian legal system. Although I do know some Russian lawyers, I've met Russian lawyers over the years. I know they operate in firm structures similar to you know, what we'd find in other countries, um, but in terms of how to gain experience and, and you know, the, the willingness of Russian firms, whether they're big, medium-sized or small to take on young graduates, I'm just not, uh, I don't think, legitimate to really, really speak on that. I would say, though, if you are interested in practicing internationally, uh, the best thing you can do is, well, there's two things you have to do. Number one, if you're, you know, let's say just, I don't know if you're all Russian, but let's imagine that you're a Russian uh, student studying in Russia, studying Russian law, wanting to practice law, maybe internationally. You got to do two things. Number one, you've got to know your own home legal system, right? You've got to be competent in a system where you're trained and perhaps practicing or qualified to practice law. And then second, you've got to find a way to get some international experience, right? You've got to find a way, maybe that's an internship, maybe that's, you know, uh, um, finding a job in another country. Maybe it's getting a degree, a diploma from a university at, in, a, in a different country. But that internationalization component, I think, is really important. You've got to have kind of the home base, which is your own legal system. And you've got to be competent there. But you've also got to have that outward 
looking approach where you uh, have some experience in another market, whether that case that's working at law firms, maybe it's an international organization. And that's not always easy because a lot of times it's very competitive. And a lot of times those opportunities might be very poorly paid or even unpaid. And so that might be a big restriction on what you're able to do. But it is important that if it is it's something that you do see yourself doing or wanting to try, you're able to at least branch out and get some some type of international experience. Because I think that uh, that is what is looked for by people who recruit lawyers for you know large firms or organizations or whatever the case may be. Probably, uh, uh, probably this is, uh, um, uh, and I think that the law. Uh, the law students are a bit more acknowledgeable with the fact but you know i i'm just getting one more question from mm -hmm. uh, from someone uh among our audiences sure um uh, uh, could you please tell about your own point of view on the russian legal system <laughs> uh, uh, this is okay to talk freely on the matter uh since um, we are we are very transparent and we okay yeah well, my, my, my point of view on the Russian legal system is quite limited. I've had very, very limited experience with uh, the Russian legal system. Let me put it this way. I negotiated a contract once with a party in Russia. It was a commercial contract. It was an international contract. It was actually for the develop custom development of a software application. My client was in the U.S., uh, and they were doing business with a firm in Russia, and, they, and my client was the software developer. And so it was a... Um, <clears throat> It was a international or transnational contract, and we were, on behalf of our client, very protective in the sense that we said, we don't know anything about the Russian legal system. We're not going to know anything about the Russian legal system, so let's avoid the Russian legal system to the extent possible. Okay, how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, what we did is, in the contract, in the legal, the law students will know that this is just a basic principle of private international law. But what we did is we made the, make very clear the choice of law being, in this particular case, it was U.S. law. But we chose an arbitration institution for any particular dispute arising out of the contract. Now, we had another particularity with this contract in the sense that uh, it needed to be written both in English and Russian. So we had the contract. It was one page with two columns. And we had on one hand, on one side, we had the English version. And then on the other side, we had the Russian language version. Now, of course, we did not write the Russian language version. We put it in Google Translate, just made sure it looked like what we thought it should look like in English. But there was no way that we could verify word for word what it would say. And so what did we do? We made sure there was also a clause in the contract saying that the English language version of this contract is the official language of this contract. Because both sides could speak English, but only one side could speak Russian. So in that sense, I don't have a particular viewpoint on the Russian legal system uh, from experience, but I did. I, I can say that in my professional experience, having limited contact, uh, my advice was let's just stay away from it because it's unfamiliar to us. And that's a very common viewpoint from lawyers, isn't it, right? If we're advising our client, we're trying to reduce the risk and the unknown, the unknown in and of itself is a risk. And so, um, that's what we did in that particular circumstance, and that, that would just be my anecdotal uh, answer to that question. Uh, but in terms of more generally speaking, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's just a question of, um, yeah, I, I'm always going to view the Russian legal system from, from the outsider's point of view, right? And I'm always going to say, you know, if you're doing business with the Russian party, you probably don't want to be, you don't want to give them the home court advantage or the home field advantage. You're going to want to remove your case from the Russian legal system, maybe put it in neutral arbitration or something like that. And I wouldn't blame a Russian party for doing the same thing with a French party or an American party or anything like that. That's just kind of how these international neg negotiations go, right? That's how they go. So um, that's my viewpoint on that, I suppose. I see a thumbs up. I hope that's a positive. Uh yeah, that, that, that's for sure. We have uh, a lot of appreciation, but my personal point of view is that uh, uh, you would better to stay away from Russian court because uh, the law very often doesn't tell nothing to these people. Well, and look, that's just the reality in a lot of places in the world. Um, you, you can look online and there's what we call the rule of law index. 
rule of law is the idea that um, every country, of course, has laws, right? But different countries have different levels of law enforcement. In other words, we can say the law is X, but maybe nobody follows the law and nobody cares. That would mean that rule of law enforcement is low. And uh, certain countries have higher levels of rule of law enforcement than others. The countries which are seen to be, you know, the most, I guess, secure in terms of rule of law are like the Nordic countries, Sweden and Denmark, et cetera, right? And then you get, you know, down the list and, and, and countries which, unfortunately, it, it seems to have a correlation at least with economic development. And so the less developed the country is economically, perhaps, and it's not always the case, but very often the rule of law enforcement in those countries is somewhat less. Uh, in Russia, you know, like I said, we can look at it, you can look it up. You can look up the rule of law index. You can see where Russia ranks next to other countries. Um, and I would imagine just my, my, my uh, guess would be that it would be somewhere in the middle, right? In terms of rule of law enforcement. Uh, countries like France or the US are right next to each other on the list. They're kind of in, in the upper teens or 20s, right? Uh, and like I said, those Scandinavian countries, those smaller countries, seem to have um, and very highly economic development developed countries have cultures where the rule of law is highly enforced you know that means that the court system is fair and impartial judges are not accepting bribes that's one thing but there's also you know legislation how is legislation created who's making the laws is it a transparent process is it a fair process there's also just the general enforcement of law on the street Right? Are policemen actually fairly enforcing the law? Are they asking for bribes? Is that kind of thing going on? And that stuff's happened to me in countries, in various countries in the world. So this is, these are not problems unique to any one place. I just want to make that clear. And um, that's, that's an interesting topic. That's a whole other topic, right? Rule of law, the enforcement of law in countries uh, is by no means, as you all know, uniform throughout the world. So interesting point. That's for sure. Uh, we have a question, and uh, shall we just give a word to another speaker? Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, Mr. Mr. Gleason. Hello, other participants of um, our conference. I, Alex Mantikov, study law at uh, Moscow State University. And uh, as I as as I understood you, you don't uh, trust uh, the Russian uh, law. That's not what How I said. You, hmm? That's not exactly what I said, but go ahead. I'll, I'll clarify in a minute. You will say it is uh, quite risky in the, the Russian le uh, legislation is uh, not uh, so uh, so quite uh, it's uh, so quite unique. Uh, what do you think? Where uh, do you think? Uh, if, uh, if we can uh, compare the Russian law with the law of a uh, 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 of a law of a of a Eastern European uh, countries, uh, if uh, if uh, if there is any differences. Uh, well, okay, okay. I just want to clarify are, one. Th uh, international. Yeah, can I can I just clarify one thing real quick? Um, I didn't. I hope I hope that's not what you understood. I, I didn't want to say I don't trust Russian law. That's not exactly what I said. What I meant to say, maybe I wasn't clear enough before, is simply that I don't know Russian law, right? And so when my example that I gave you, when I advise a client to choose something other than Russian law, it's not inherently because I don't trust Russian law. It's because I don't know Russian law. And so my advice is to be safe to my client, say, hey, I understand how, for example, US law or French law works. From our bargaining position in a contractual relationship, let's see if we can convince our business partner to agree to a contract on our terms, using our local law that we're familiar with, that we're comfortable with. We're more comfortable with, there's less risk for us because we know the law, but we don't necessarily know Russian law. And that was that was simply my point there. I don't I don't want to say that you know uh, Russian law is bad or something like that. I just don't know. I don't think I'm qualified to say either way on that. And to answer your question, unfortunately, I think because of my limitation in knowledge there, I can't really compare it to Eastern European countries uh, or otherwise. Okay, um, so it's hard for me to answer that question. I apologize. I don't think I'm 
I don't want to say something that's wrong. Let's put it that way. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for thank you for your answer. Can I ask you some more questions? Please. Uh, I in this if in uh, this year I graduated from uh, law school uh, school and uh, and uh, if uh, there is any possibilities uh, to become an uh, intern in the uh, in the international law firms abroad, how do you think? Uh, sure. Is there? Sure. So yes. I study only the Russian law, and can I get an intern position in the law, law firms at the, at, the, at the international law firms, not in Russia, but in other countries? If yeah, it's possible. And, and how that would generally work uh, is, well, let's talk about what you should potentially target. If you're trying to find any, if you've only studied Russian law, um, but you want to work at a law firm as an intern outside of Russia, what should you target? Well, you should try to find firms which are representing clients who have interests in Russia, right? So maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a law firm in Germany or, or Vienna, Austria, or you know somewhere else that has uh, relationships with people in Russia. That's, I think, one thing you could do. Now, it might not always be easy to target who those firms are, but you can find, I think what you can do is you can find law firms who have that kind of broad practice and especially focusing on Eastern Europe and Russia. I think that's one way to do it. Uh, there's also, of course, international organizations which are uh, based outside of Russia but have an interest in hiring diverse group of people to be interns and work for the international organizations, whether that's the United Nations or other organizations. That's not a private context, that's more of a public context, but that's another way to do it. So there definitely are opportunities. I'm not gonna say it's easy to find those opportunities. Um, and like I said earlier, one of the problems with those types of opportunities often is that there's a lot of people who wanna do that. And so those opportunities may not be fairly compensated in the sense that maybe they're unpaid internships or lowly paid internships. So you have to take that into consideration as well. But there are possibilities. So you just have to do your research. You have to reach out to people. You have to go to, and unfortunately right now you don't meet people face to face, but you go to events like this, ask questions, get to know people. And you know, that's, that's one way to do it. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much for for replying to us, and thank you very much. Uh, may I please ask you, uh, do do someone else uh, want want to say something on the matter? Maybe you, someone else has uh, some questions to be asked. Uh, this is okay. So probably probably we are out of questions. Okay, so uh, I would like just to thank you for finding time for us. And uh, I would like to say that uh, for me personally, uh, it was uh, such a pleasure to see you once again. As, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, I apologize. We just have one more question. Could you please take a moment to, uh, to reply? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay, so... Um, there was a question about your experience and about some uh, some cases you can share with us uh, in order to show the practical uh, application of of the law. I, I, I believe that this question was uh, not very specific, but uh, it actually has uh, something to do with um, the general interest about knowing uh, of some of the cases you have experienced. Maybe you okay. can explain something. Sure. All right. So, I mean, I already talked about one case that I, I, I mentioned with you guys about the investment case in, in the Republic of Moldova, for example. Uh, that was a case I mentioned earlier. That's the area of investment law. Um, I mentioned the case about negotiating contract with the Russian firm about software development. Um, that's kind of a transactional case. Uh, it's not really a case. It's more just a negotiation between parties. And so that's where I kind of split my career into doing dispute resolution 
and transactional. I probably do more dispute resolution than I do transactional. What I mean by transactional is just writing, reviewing, revising contracts, negotiating contracts. I've done that, I've done some of that, but really, like I said, most of my career is in the dispute resolution context. And boy, I uh, just give you general examples of disputes. I've done many over the years, so it's hard to kind of um, give you just specific examples off the top of my head. Let me just talk about a couple cases. Uh, a lot of the work I've done is in arbitration. A lot of the cases I've done are, are in arbitration. Uh, there was a case I did a few years back where um, it was a fraud case. It's a fraud case. And uh, our client had signed, he'd started a business with somebody else. I've gotten a lot of these cases where people start businesses and then the business falls apart and they wanna break up. Well, what's the problem when you break up a business? The problem is you've got money, you've got assets that you've got to split up between the parties who started the business together. It's kind of like what we call a business divorce. And I've done a lot of these cases over the years. I had a case a few years back, uh, which was interesting. It actually got a lot of attention in the United States because it created new laws through jurisprudence. But the reason that was interesting is because our client wanted to leave a business he started with somebody else because he thought the other person committed fraud. He thought the other person lied to him, essentially, to get him to start the business, didn't bring the money that he was supposed to bring, et cetera. There were a lot of problems. And the problem was our client and the other party had signed a series of eight separate contracts to start the business. And each contract had a different clause for dispute resolution. And all of them called for arbitration, going outside of the court system and using private dispute resolution. But every single arbitration clause was different. There was just minor differences between each arbitration clause. Our client said, I don't want to go to court. Excuse me, I don't want to go to arbitration. I want to go to court. Why did our client want to go to court? Well, because court is public. And he wanted this guy who he thought committed fraud to have to go in a public court proceeding so other people would know that this court proceeding was going on. And arbitration by its very nation is private. It's not public. And it can be made confidential. So our job in that case was to file a lawsuit on behalf of our client against his former business partner and do it in the public court, even though he had signed eight contracts saying he would not use the public court system and he would use private dispute resolution. How do you do that? Well, what we did is we analyzed each contract and we said, if we look at the arbitration clause in each contract, we see that there's differences in each one. We made the argument, it's like that there wasn't enough clarity in what the parties actually agreed to concerning dispute resolution. Think of it this way. If you and I <clears throat> agree to buy a car, did we? so you, you have a car, I want to buy the car, and we agree that you'll sell me a car, but we don't put any specifications about the car in the contract. We don't say what make, what model, what year, what color, what engine, any of that stuff. Did we actually agree on anything? And our argument is no, we didn't. There's not enough detail in uh, the agreement to know what we actually agreed to. There's eight separate agreements. We made the argument that each agreement was different. Therefore, we don't even know what the parties ultimately agreed to. Therefore, we have the right to go to court. And we won at the lower level and it was appealed to a higher level. And um, it was appealed, it, was, it went in front of a judge who's now on the Supreme Court of the United States. And we actually won the case on appeal too, and then it was dropped. It didn't go to the Supreme Court of the United States. Because that argument, that analogy between you know, buying a car, but without having any details of what the car actually is, was a convincing argument to the court that um, we shouldn't go to arbitration, we should go to the public court proceeding. And after we won that preliminary argument, that was a procedural argument, it took a year to figure out, but once we figured that out, uh, the other party settled the case. They said, we don't want to go to court. We don't want our other clients knowing that we're uh, accused of fraud, et cetera. So that's one example of a type of case I've worked on. I mentioned at the beginning, I've worked on a lot of products liability cases over the years. Cases where a product causes injury to somebody, they suffer harm, they're able to sue the company for the damage that they suffered. I've done a lot of breach of contract cases over the years where there's just you know simple... And a lot of times a breach of contract case doesn't actually go to trial. A lot of times cases 
In fact, nine times out of 10, when I take a case, I don't actually go to a trial, whether that's in a court or private arbitration, because the parties throughout the proceeding, they work towards a settlement and they can oftentimes resolve the dispute without actually having to go to a final proceeding. That's very cultural. Different cultures have different approaches on that. Uh, and I don't know what the dispute resolution approach in Russia is, for example. I don't know how likely it is for parties in Russia to settle. Right? Do you fight to the death or do you say, okay, wait, we need to make a commercially reasonable decision here. We need to stop paying our lawyers a bunch of money. Maybe, you know, we don't have to admit we were wrong, but maybe we can give the other party something to resolve the dispute rather than just keep spending money on lawyers and fighting and fighting and fighting. That's very much a um, uh, decision made in each case and culture does play a role in that as well. So, I mean, those are just some examples. I know they're very, very general, but I hope that helps give you an idea of the types of cases I've worked on over the years. Um, and I know I'm over my time, so I, I won't go any further. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I think that on the behalf of everyone who visited our our conference, because participants were changing with the time passing, as you yeah, could sure. probably uh, admitted that, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you very much for finding time for us. And uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much from me personally, uh, because I'm really, I really ap do appreciate seeing you once again. Thank you. I've appreciated being here. And I'm sorry if I couldn't answer everybody's questions with great specificity, but I've enjoyed speaking with you. And uh, I was happy to, happy to appear and uh, have a discussion with you guys. It was nice. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a nice day, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. So we are about to go. So guys, we are about to go.